Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 56 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next nearly half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur talking about things important to me, I think deserve your attention. Um, I like to say at the top of the show, as always, uh, that any comments, questions, reactions, plaudits, brickbats, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which you probably didn't, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple times during the show. And uh, you can get the email address directly from there. I do answer my email. Sometimes it'll slow about it, but I do. Um, I only ask that if you send me email, that in the subject line you include something like, you know, your, your cable show or a left side of the aisle or something like that, so I know it's not spam. I also like, I've been trying for weeks to remember to mention this, and that I mention it now. Uh, if you want to check out the sources that I use for the things that I say here on the show, they are at the website. Okay, so you can look for them there. Now, I got a couple of things I'm going to try to get through today. Uh, the first is one where I've started often enough with good news on this particular topic. So this week I may start with the bad news. North Carolina has become the 29th state, including the entire South, uh, to enact a state constitutional amendment defining marriage as being between one man and one woman. Uh, in fact, this one goes further than most of those other cases because it says, and I quote, that, the, that this, this form of marriage will be, I'm quoting it here, the only domestic legal union that shall be valid or recognized in this state. Which means this not only bans same-sex marriage, it bans civil unions. It de bans domestic partnerships for both straight and same-sex couples. It also threatens the domestic partnership health benefits available to local government workers in the state. It can strip unmarried couples, again, whether straight or same sex, of their rights to make financial or medical decisions in an emergency for an incapacitated partner. It could actually deprive unmarried women of protections against, against domestic abuse. Uh, and it would restrict child custody matters and uh, visitation rights for unmarried couples, again, whether they are uh, straight or same sex. This is truly like a really hideous provision. Now, personally, I have to admit, I've wondered if this, this provision could be challenged in federal court on some of those bases. I'm reminded of the fact that California's Proposition 8, or Prop 8 as it came to be call, called, um, was challenged successfully in federal court, at least so far, pending further appeals, but it was challenged successfully in federal court, uh, largely on the grounds that it took away rights that had already existed, um, which clearly this amendment would do, but I haven't seen anybody actually talking about doing that, so maybe for some reason it's not an option there. Anyway, uh, six states... And the, and the District of Columbia um, have now approved same-sex marriage. Uh, two more, uh, Maryland and Washington, have also uh, approved same-sex marriage. But um, uh, their laws just haven't gone into effect yet. They just haven't gone into effect yet. But the thing is, talking about these laws brings up, um, well, it brings up a silver lining, if you will, in this. Because even with this, it is not all bad news. Uh, today, Barack Obama, today as I was preparing this, Barack Obama came out in favor of same-sex marriages. He has evolved, as he would put it. Uh, so there's actually, you know, a break in the clouds. Even getting back to the North Carolina thing itself, there is a, a, a break in the clouds there. Um, since 1996, the, uh, the state has had a law that bans, or rather that defines, marriage as one man and one woman. So the question is, why go to the trouble of a constitutional amendment to do what the law already does? Well, proponents of this amendment said that the, this was necessary to keep, quote, activist judges or politicians from overturning the law. Now, note well, they didn't just say the, the right-wing boogeyman activist judges. They said activist politicians 
They were afraid that at some point in the future, the elected legislature of North Carolina might overturn this law. They just wanted to keep the state from being able to do that. And equal to revealing on this, on this count was the statement of one Tammy Fitzgerald. She chaired the, the, the victorious coalition of cretins on this. She said after the vote, this is a quote, we are not anti-gay, we are pro-marriage. Now, leaving aside the obvious absurdity of saying you are pro-marriage while you're trying to prevent people from getting married, is, you know, leaving that aside, her statement actually unintentionally revealed the necessity of concealing the anti-gay bigotry that was um, part of her movement's drive. Thing is, these people know that they are on the wrong side of history. They know the polls. They know that increasing numbers and very often now majorities of Americans actually approve of same-sex marriage. They know they are losing. They know that they know that the next generation is going to grow up and be going like, what's the big deal about two men or two women getting married? What's all the fuss about? These people, these haters, these bigots, they know that history will come to regard them with the same contempt it now regards people who as said not that long ago that blacks and whites couldn't get married. They just want to do as much damage. They want to do as much damage to the, to the flow of justice as they can before, happily for everybody else, they die off. I've said it before, it's still a good ways off. But the fact is, on this topic... We can say justice will come. Okay, I'm going to move on from there. Um, I'm going to mention very briefly uh, this thing about this supposed plot to blow up a U.S. airliner. And I say supposed because it hasn't been you know, tried yet. The thing is, after a little hemming and hawing, it develops that the supposed suicide bomber in this case actually either was a plant, possibly from Saudi intelligence, or was somebody who had been turned into an informant early in the planning for this thing, and the people involved had been tracked for weeks. What this means is another dastardly plot, another plot that's supposed to leave us trembling in fear of what could have happened and saying, oh, please protect us. Another plot whose primary purpose seems to have been to justify the use of, the, of those full body scanners, those strip scanners at airports. There's another dastardly plot that turns out on examination to really have had very little chance of ever coming to anything. Now, there was good work done here. Okay, good work. I'm not mocking the work. There was good work done here on this. But I do feel the need to point out that more than 10 years ago, January 5th, 2002, in an unpublished op-ed, I wrote this, that, quoting, patient police work of effective investigation and intelligence has done and will do more to oppose terrorism than all our bombing sorties combined. And I think this latest case is just another proof, if proof was needed, of the simple truth of that statement. Okay, now, moving on to our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, you probably know that five people suspected of being involved in uh, plotting the 9-11 attacks are on trial before a military tribunal at Guantanamo Bay in, in Cuba. The best known among these five is probably Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the man who was waterboarded 183 times before he was sent to Gitmo. But the thing is, you won't hear about that at the trial. In fact, if the government has its way, you won't hear a single word about torture or any mistreatment any of these five uh, received. See, the rules under which they're being held are set by the commandant of Guantanamo Bay, who has decided that the issue of torture is so important to our national security that lawyers for the defense are forbidden to talk to their clients about it. This is called presumptive classification. And what it means is that anything that detainees say uh, that bears on the sources or methods of their capture or captivity, in other words, their torture, all of this is a state secret. 
Now, the chief prosecutor in the case says, oh, they can talk to their clients about anything, except they can't use or make reference to any classified document that describes or refers to what any of these five were put through after they were taken, because it's as if those five don't know. Now, um, at the same time that the government is making it difficult, if not impossible, for defense attorneys to talk to their clients about the, what they were subjected to, the Obama administration is also moving to censor any references in the actual proceedings to torture or any other mistreatment. The ACLU has filed a motion to challenge this, and that's one of the ways we learned about this. This motion notes that the government has uh, proposed a protective order, quote unquote. This would allow the state, the government, to suppress any statement by uh, any of the detainees, any of the accused, about any torture or any mistreatment that they'd suffered, preventing the public, the press, and even from trial observers from hearing them. And what's more, the government wants a 40-second delay in the audio feed of the proceedings so that if some attorney or some one of the defendants violates this protective order, there's more than enough time to censor the record. Now, the, and this is the Obama administration. Remember, this is the same outfit. Why we shouldn't be surprised. This is the same outfit that declared the authority to kill citizens based on secret evidence with no due process. This is the outfit that has refused to prosecute, much less even investigate, self-confessed war criminals. And now, and now it looks away and whistles a happy tune as this lizard-brained Jose Rodriguez, the man who was in charge of the torturing of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the man who has admitted destroying evidence of illegal CIA interrogations, appears on 60 Minutes to smirk and preen and plug his book and pat himself on the back about how proud he is of his crimes against humanity. And what gets him even more about this is how little outcry that there's been. How little outrage there seems to be. How little anger there is at these, these criminals, these moral degenerates, the, these, as, as these people, they smugly strut about, confident that they won't be touched for things that when people in other countries did it, we hung them for it. I'm, I'm astonished at how little we as a people seem to care as our moral core degenerates and we increasingly become that which we say we oppose. The outrage of the week, it's us. And we're going to take a break. And here we are again. Uh, this next thing is something I mentioned very briefly, just about like a minute at the end of last week's show. It has to do with CISPA, the, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. This is a bill that threatens, quite literally, to make online privacy a thing of the past. Um, where it will make it such that everything we say, do, read, write, look at, record, whatever we do online will be subject to being shared with any government agency. Now, this bill, as I mentioned last week, it had just passed the House of Representatives uh, with bipartisan support, and it's moved to the Senate. Now, as I described this bill a couple of weeks ago, it's supposedly about protecting uh, network security. Uh, it would allow the NSA, the National Security Agency, to share data with ISPs and other telecoms, um, which could also share data with each other about network security. As Representative Dutch Ruppersberger said, it would allow these, these people to share, quoting him, formulas, X's and O's, the virus code. Now, I'm pretty sure that instead of X's and O's, what he actually meant was ones and zeros. It's nice to know that the bill's co-sponsor is so familiar with the technology he wants to write laws about. The problem with the bill is that there are no real limits on what could be shared or who it could be shared with. This allows companies to share information pertaining to the protection of a system or a network, a definition which positively invites the broadest possible interpretation. 
And the bill also contains a cybersecurity exception to any and all privacy laws. So there was a real source of concern that once the information was obtained for cybersecurity purposes, there were no restrictions on how else it could be used. Uh, to put it in more legalistic language, it allowed the government to use the data obtained under the bill for any non-regulatory purpose, so long as there was at least one cybersecurity or national security purpose. So by claiming a cybersecurity purpose, this information could be obtained and do an end run about around every privacy law, even around the Fourth Amendment. Just before the final vote, uh, an amendment was passed, supposedly to limit what the bill could be used for. Now, it was originally for cybersecurity or national security purposes. This amendment added three more. Uh, investigation and prosecution of cybersecurity crime, which means like network disruption and hacking, uh, the protection of individuals, and the protection of children. Now, adding those three specifics was supposed to head off the open-ended nature of the authority in the bill, but whether this actually made the bill better or worse is a matter of debate. In fact, as one writer at TechDirt said, it closed a loophole but opened a door. He said, and I'm quoting him here, it takes away some of the language that, that allows overreach of the bill, but then explicitly endorses the exact things people were worried government would do with that language, as in start using the data to investigate and build cases against American citizens without regard to the laws that would normally protect their privacy. Now, Barack Obama had promised to veto this bill if it reached his desk in its present form. That was before this amendment. There's been no word about whether or not uh, this amendment would give him enough wiggle room to say he would go along with it. But right now, um, all the intention, all the focus is on the Senate. Um, two things are happening there. One, for the moment, it looks like the House passed CISPA bill is not going anywhere uh, because the White House and Senate Democrats have endorsed an alternative bill which uh, was proposed by Senators Joe Lyingman and Susan Amatahir Collins. Uh, this bill has tougher privacy protections in CISPA and would also authorize the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland to set mandatory standards for protection of critical infrastructure, which CISPA does not address. Now, the idea of government set standards produces a Pavlovian response in the right wing uh, so it's, of course, against this alternative bill. They call it big government overreach, as if the total destruction of privacy rights under CISPA was not. Right now, Democrats do not have the 60 votes they would need to overcome a Gopper filibuster. They know it. In fact, aides say that the, that the leadership of the party in the Senate is now um, in, in talks with multiple members to try to adjust the language of the bill to make it palatable enough to enough of Republicans to get it passed. Um, which then you wonder if it's going to be worth passing at all. The vice president of technology of, uh, of a, uh, I'm sorry, a vice president of a technology company trade association noted that the election is only a couple of months away. And um, the clock is ticking. And the longer it takes to get anything done here, the harder it will be for any kind of bill to pass. To which I say, thank God for gridlock. All right, last thing for today. New concerns have been raised about the, uh, whether or not the economy is stumbling again. The government's uh, produced its second consecutive subpar monthly jobs report. Now, unemployment actually went down from 8.2%, 8.1% in April, but two big reasons for that were, one, the expiration of emergency unemployment insurance programs in an increasing number of states, and two, a number of people have just given up altogether on finding work. 342,000 people left the workforce in April. In fact, in the first quarter of 2012, the economy grew at a real annualized rate of 2.2%, which is pretty anemic. By comparison, the average for the entire period of 1947 to 2011 was nearly 3.3%. 3 
But still, despite that, despite the sluggish economy, despite people can't even find work, they give up on it, what are we talking about? We're talking about deficits. We're talking about where we can cut. We're talking about where we can do less. In fact, some people are now predicting that after the election, both parties will be ready to work to work out a deal uh, to cut spending, including on Social Security and Medicare. And that the argument will be over just what to cut and just how deep to cut, not on if to cut. Austerity is to be the watchword. Now, one would hope that the anti-austerity backlash um, uh, by voters in Greece and France uh, just recently uh, uh, shook the entire Eurozone. You, you would hope that would give them some pause because it showed that there is at long last a limit to how much people will put up with. These austerity measures in Europe, uh, they produced 11% unemployment across the Eurozone, a double dip reception in, in Great Britain, and four years of recession and wage and pension cuts in Greece, which there have produced nothing except continually rising unemployment. These austerity measures have proven yet again, if proof was needed, that you can't get out of recessions by taking money out of the hands of people who will spend it. You can't grow by doing less. Putting all your emphasis on reducing deficits in the light of a stagnant or even a contracting economy, it may help the banks, but it won't help the people. Despite that, despite all this, the idea of cutting the deficit the idea that that idea, cut the deficit, is the most important economic issue before us, is now getting another run in, in D.C. This is insanity. And the most recent, the most blatant, perhaps, example of this insanity comes from Representative Paul Ranton, uh, who's new, if I can stretch the word far enough to make it fit, budget, not only proposes massive cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, environmental programs, education, transportation programs, and more, but makes them even deeper than they would otherwise be for the specific and avowed purpose of protecting the militarists in the Pentagon from having to take any more cuts at all. This is a budget, I have to say. This is what, one of the things I wanted to say about this. This is a budget that too many on the left have taken on and criticized as unworkable and doomed to failure. That, however, is a political blunder because Paul Ranton and the rest of his crew know this thing won't pass. They don't care. I, don't you get it? They don't care. They really don't. This is not a financial document. It's an ideological one. This is not a budget. Its purpose isn't to pass any time in the foreseeable future. It's to make what it argues the basis for comparison, to make it a point of reference. So sure, you can take a critical look at the numbers. Sure, you can cite the analyses. But what you don't do is stop there. You don't, what you don't do is take this budget seriously as a document. You don't approach it as if it was a serious proposal of serious people that was sufficiently reasonable to deserve careful rebuttal. Instead, you try to put it outside the range of normal discussion. Denounce it. Decry it. Demonize it. Call it names. They're easy enough to come by because they're all true. Don't just say it would end Medicare. Say it's wild-eyed fanaticism that would destroy the fabric of American society. Say it would decimate probably without using that highfalutin sounding word, but say it would decimate our economy. It would ruin our environment. It would dismember our society. Say it proves their utter disregard for the welfare of American families. Call it a program of the rich, by the rich, for the rich. Say it would plunge us back into the worst days of the robber barons. Call it part of a plot to undo a century of social and economic progress. Label a fringe document created by fringe people for a fringe element. Call it a rejection of American principles, a, pr a, a rejection of justice, a rejection of fairness, that it's beyond the pale, around the bend, over the top, insists that it does not deserve the regard of normal people. The attack should be unrelenting. One thing the right does, at which the left too often fails, is to be open about what it's after. Even if the ideas are unpopular, they will repeat them over and over, um, it's a classic way of moving the Overton window, pushing the ideas that are beyond the fringe because then fringe ideas become more acceptable. By contrast, the left seems incapable of such, sort of such thinking. 
preferring to all but exclusively focus on what will pass this year and then call for, or more properly, ask for that. In the real world, in the real world of real politics, at the end of the day, you will all but always end up with less than you asked for. So if you start it by asking for the most you think will pass, you're going to wind up even with less than that. Now, which brings me back to the point. The reactionaries don't care if this so-called budget passes because it isn't a budget, it's a cause. And that causes the undoing of what I have come to call the commons. The idea of a notion of common interest and mutual responsibilities among citizens. They want to undo the social contract between the people and the government. And that's why this document must be attacked, not as a budget, but as what it is. Part of an immoral cause born of greed, selfishness, and indifference to any injustice experienced by others. And it's also why it's a terrible mistake that actually plays into the hands of the reactionaries to treat it any other way. And if you're of a religious mind, you might recall that Rabbi Hillel said that the whole Torah comes down to that which is hateful to you, do not do to others. Or if you're more of a Christian mind, you might refer to the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke and call Ranton's budget the work of the priest or the Levite who crossed the road and ignored the injured man. And by the way, a plot to undo more than a century of social economic progress. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. That's not an overstatement. Back in 1995, George Will, you know him, the great intellectual of the right wing. George Will had a column where he said that a serviceable summation of the right-wing goal, of the conservatives' goal, he said. A serv serviceable summation of the conservatives' goal is back to 1900. Back to 1900, to a time when there weren't legal labor unions, there weren't anti-monopoly laws, a time for child labor, 12-hour workdays, a time before consumer environmental laws, before regulations requiring safe working conditions when dying at work was a major cause of death, a time before Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, disability insurance, back to when poor people were considered mental defectives who deserved their conditions, B back before civil or voting rights laws, when wives were chattel, when blacks were either regarded as good niggers who got called boy or uppity niggers who got lynched, when racism against At Italians, Irish, and others, as well as blacks, um, was institutionalized, sexism the norm, gays and lesbians didn't exist as far as their society was concerned. That's the kind of world that the conservatives openly admit they want to bring us back to. They said it, we should say it too. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of time. Um, remember June 16th for our uh, open house here, noon to six. Come on down, see us all, and you just have the best week you can, and I'll see you next week.